Lord, by your Spirit, open our hearts and our lives to your word. That in hearing we may believe, and that in believing we may respond. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is taken from pages 94 and 95 in the New Testament, from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 3 through 26. Again, that's pages 94 and 95 of the New Testament, John, chapter 4, verses 3 through 26. You may follow along if you wish. <clears throat> He left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. But the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so they may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, and the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. No, preaching sitting down doesn't seem, doesn't seem right. Uh, so we are, um, we are continuing our look this fall uh, at, at who we have heard God calling us to be as, as this particular church, uh, as Calvin Presbyterian Church here, uh, here in this time and in this place. And we're doing that through the lens of our church mission statement. And we're also doing it with, a, with an eye towards stewardship, towards gifts and talents and Time and yes, money. Uh, what we we're looking at it with an eye towards what we are investing in, what we are being invited to to give towards and invest in, what we are giving to, what we are what we are committing to with our time and talents and money when we give to the church. Right? We're asking, you know, are we are we just giving so that we can we can pay bills and have a building and the sorts of things that organizations need to, to just kind of hold on through the years? Or are we giving towards something bigger, something greater and grander and far more beautiful than, than a spreadsheet? And so we have discerned this mission statement, this claim of our identity as this church that we are called to live out and to live into. Does anyone remember what it is? I'm going to ask every single week. We are a Christ-centered community. 
welcoming all in hope and grace as we worship God, grow in faith, and serve one another. So last week we looked a little bit at that first part, as the call to be a Christ-centered community and, and how that's more than just, uh, just finding a group of people you like being around, but, but it is in fact integral to the very essence of the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus. And today we're looking at the next part, welcoming all in hope and grace. This idea of welcoming, uh, as you, you may have guessed if you were listening to the, to the time of the children, we might think of it as offering hospitality. In this passage from John, there's, there's all sorts of dynamics at work here in this, in this interaction between Jesus and this, uh, the, the unnamed Samaritan woman there at that well in the hot noonday sun. But not surprisingly, given what I've just said, what I want us to, to look at in this passage this morning is where welcome and hospitality show up throughout their interaction. Now the first thing to make note of, before we really jump in, the first thing to make note of um, is right there at the beginning. Jesus is on his way from Judea to Galilee, and it says, but he had to go through Samaria. And there's a little Greek word in that sentence there at the, the beginning, there in that sentence. The Greek word is day. Not D-A-Y day, but uh, Delta Epsilon Iota day. And it's a little word that means of necessity. Every time that word is used in John in this way, every time it's used, it's about a theological necessity. John has verses that say things like, you must be born again or born from above. The Son of Man must be lifted up. You must worship God in spirit and truth. Jesus must rise from the dead. It's that same word. It was of necessity, John says, that Jesus go through Samaria. There is an active intentionality here at work. Jesus is purposefully going to this place, <coughs> this time, for a very particular reason. So he comes hot and dusty, tired and thirsty to a well. He sits there. Soon a Samaritan woman comes along. Jesus asks her for a drink. And the Samaritan woman, she remarks that there is a whole host of reasons why this was awkward and improper. There's gender dynamics, interfaith dynamics, social and political dynamics. But there he is, in need of a drink. And so begins this conversation about water and thirst and, and past grievances and identity all going on here in their conversation. Now, history hasn't been very fair or kind to the Samaritan woman. Many of our standard assumptions that have built up over the years are that when Jesus comments about her marital history and her current status, he's, he's pointing out to her all the sin in her life. So, so much has been put on her through over the years about how she must therefore be morally suspect and things like that. We've, we've made her bear the weight of shame and guilt over the centuries. But none of that is here in the text. None of that is in the story. It's just as likely that, that she has been widowed a number of times. See, there's no language of sin or forgiveness or even a call to repent from a sinful life here. The most, so the most we can say is that she, probably like all of us, in one way or another, has just been at the mercy of that strange interplay of circumstances and just trying to make the best choices that we can in the middle of it all, trying to navigate the hand we've been dealt. That's who she is. So Jesus doesn't say all this about her life because he needs to then offer her forgiveness or a call, a strong call to repent. We know that's not the case because that's not what Jesus does. But there's something else at work here. All of this started 
because she was invited to engage with a tired, thirsty sojourner, a stranger who needed a drink. I know it's not in John, but I can't help think, like we talked about with the children, I can't help think of where Matthew 20, in Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, and he has those lines. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then his disciples say, well, when did we do that? Maybe even when did we fail to do that? For you. And Jesus says, when you did it, for the least of these, you did it unto me. Right? Jesus is here. He's right here, offering a Samaritan woman, offering her a chance to show hospitality, to welcome him. And the result of this is that things suddenly, throughout their interaction, things suddenly get flipped all upside down because, because then in the middle of that, it turns out that Jesus is now the one offering her water, living water. What started out as her being invited, having the opportunity to offer a stranger some hospitality, to be the host for this stranger there at the well, well, Jesus, it turns out, he is now the host. He is the one offering her hospitality, welcoming her into his life. So remember the beginning of this passage. It was of necessity. There was theological necessity. It was theologically necessary that Jesus go through Samaria. The hospitality that Jesus offers invitation, the welcome that he provides is never, no matter the appearance, it is never him just passively sitting and waiting and hoping maybe somebody will show up. It is never Jesus passively hoping that we might happen to stumble by and ring the doorbell and ask to come in or whatever it is. No, Jesus is, his, his is an active welcoming. It is Jesus that goes, that goes out, that shows up, that goes out to meet people where they are. He met the Samaritan woman where she was. Geographically, yes. Also emotionally, theologically, pastorally. He met her and her need, her physical need, her emotional need, her spiritual need. The welcome and hospitality of Jesus is not one of him just waiting passively for people to come to him. No, it is a hospitality that drives him to go out to where we are. Welcoming all in hope and grace. That's what Jesus did here, wasn't it? He met her where she was. That's grace. He welcomed her as she was and, and in who she was. That's grace. He offered her what she needed. That's grace. And he gave her a vision of what would yet be, of what could yet be. He offered her true, lasting hope. In short, Jesus was meeting her, inviting her, offering her, welcoming her into the kingdom, into the hope and grace of God, into the hope and grace of himself. And therefore, that's part of who Jesus calls us to be. A people who likewise go, meeting people where they're at, Hospitality is simply meeting people where they're at, welcoming as they are and with what they need. When you invite somebody over for dinner or to a party, right, isn't that what you do? You don't get the party ready and then just stand, stand there by the door, oh, I hope someone just happens to show up. Right? No, you actively invite. You meet them in some way where they are with an active and intentional invitation. 
And then you provide for the needs of the guest, right? That's hospitality. That's what Jesus does. We are called to likewise go and do the same. And in so doing, inviting, welcoming, whoever it is, no matter what otherwise might be the, the social or cultural, ethical or, or whatever barriers that may seem to be there. And simply through that kind of hospitality, inviting all into the hope and grace of Jesus, into the hope and grace of the kingdom, of the family of God. That's what outreach is. That's what evangelism is. Why we do things like the grief share program, which, by the way, we've been taking a break from to, to recharge a little bit, but we are looking to get it started again. And so we are looking for people who can simply provide hospitality, meet people where they're at, listen to where they're at, welcome the tears and the stories, and offer hope. And grace in the middle of it. So that's my plug there. Right? Just think about it. That's one of the ways we reach out. Or the back-to-school backpacks, or the community community events like the Easter egg hunt, or the trunk or treats. That I don't know what's going on with that with the rain. But that's why we do that, right? Any number of things. Going out into the community into active hospitality. The hymn sings and communion services, and the various um, places around the community that we do, whatever it may be, the active, intentional hospitality. Not just waiting for somebody to happen to, to stumble through the doors of the church, going, showing up. Our church has uh, supported the high school ministry Young Life for a long time. I know some of you were at the Young Life Banquet yesterday, and, and we heard the difference that can be made when there are people willing to just show up in the lives of teenagers. One of the refrains, if you were there, you heard it, one of the refrains that we heard was, was about the number of teenagers in Rhode Island that are known by name by those ministering through Young Life. That are known by name. Because somebody has gone and gotten to know a teenager, who they are, what they like and dislike, showing up to their performances and sports, whatever it is, getting to know them as a person, and then the amazing things that happen because of that. That's, that's the kind of active hospitality we are called to, that Jesus shows us here in this encounter with the woman at the well. And though certainly there is also a part of that, is asking what does it look like to be, to be welcoming, to welcome in hope and grace here in this place, through the inside the doors of this place. Hey. I had a friend once visit a church. The was church was, was big, the parking lot was full. And so she was trying to go, and so she parked the best she could along the drive. Um, along the side of the, of the driveway. It was the only place she could find a park. And after church, she came out, and there was a note on her car from one of the elders telling her she should have parked somewhere else because it was rude to damage the grass. For the record, not showing hospitality, not welcoming in hope and grace. To welcome in hope and grace is to say, what I care about, what we care about, is you where you are right now. Welcoming all hope and grace. So what became of this Samaritan woman who throughout this encounter has come to know Jesus more and more? When it starts out, he's just other. He's the them to her, us. A Jewish man. But as things unfold, she then starts to call him sir, a sign of respect. And then she calls him a prophet. And then finally he reveals himself to be the Messiah that she has said she is waiting for. So what becomes of her 
after she is welcomed into the hope and grace of Jesus. Verse 28, then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And she said to the people, come and see. A man who told me everything I'd ever done, he cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him, to Jesus. Come and see this man who knows me and welcomed me and who didn't let all those walls and barriers and all of that get in the way of talking with me, of wanting to share a drink of water with me. And by the way, if we are tempted to think that that, sharing something as simple as a drink of water, is a small thing, we have forgotten our own history. It was not that long ago where there were deep social, political, religious, and racial boundaries about where you could drink water in our own communities, and from what vessels you could drink water, and with whom you could share a drink. And the repercussions not that long ago for drinking from the wrong one or with the wrong person could be tragic. Hospitality can be dangerous. It can require great courage. She has been welcomed. She has been shown the hospitality of Jesus. And her response is to go. It's to go. Come, see the hope and grace I have found. Come meet this person I have found. Come see the hope and grace that he also offers to you. John, the gospel writer, being who he is, I suspect it is no accident that her response that he records and makes note of, to then go and say, come and see. I suspect it's no accident that it's the invitation that he records, that he chose to record for us, that echoes, the invitation that echoes the very first invitation of Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry. Because Jesus goes around and invites his first disciples with those same words, come and see. Welcoming all in hope and grace. The necessity of active hospitality, of going and meeting one another, of meeting others where they are. Offering a drink, a backpack, a shoulder to cry on and a listening ear. A time and place to just enjoy time together as a family and as a community. An opportunity to, to worship and grow and be connected and known and welcomed outside and inside the walls of the church. And a welcoming atmosphere all around that says we are far more concerned about you and where you are than grass going to grow back anyway. Of knowing that sometimes we all need help in finding our way around, whether it's navigating a, new, uh, a first time in a church or navigating life. And knowing that we are welcome to and welcomed in this place and into God's family. Jesus' earthly ministry was by and large going around inviting and welcoming people into the kingdom, playing host to the party and celebration of God drawing near. And we, like the Samaritan woman, are invited to now go and do the same, welcoming all in hope and grace, going and inviting, going and meeting others where they are with what they need. That's hospitality. That's what outreach, that's what evangelism is when you boil it down to its essence. It's an invitation and a welcome into the kingdom, into the party that God is throwing. And the story, the story that is told by a community that knows that, by a community that seeks to do that, is the story of a community that has been changed, that is being changed, 
that knows the very hospitality of Jesus, the hope and grace of Jesus that he has invited and welcomed us into. And this is the story that he invites us to yet continue to tell, reaching out, going out, because a strange thing happens when we are willing to receive the invitation of Jesus to receive his invitation for us to offer hospitality. It turns out that's one of those times that we begin to see more and more how it is Jesus who is our true host. It is Jesus that is really the one offering us all the hospitality of his grace and the hope that he brings wherever he goes. Welcoming all, hope and grace. This is who we are called to be. This is the story that we are called to tell. In the name of the one who has welcomed us to his grace, the hope that he brings. May it be so, and may we be such a people. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>